to Basic Gospel Radio, everybody. With Bob Christopher and Richard Piper, I'm Bob Davis, here to welcome you to our weekly teaching edition as we study through the pages of the New Covenant Journey Study Guide. If you don't yet have your copy, just go online to basicgospel.net slash teaching. Again, that's basicgospel.net slash teaching. And a reminder for those of you who had planned to call today, the phone lines are not open today so that everyone can listen and benefit from the study. So with that, it's Basic Gospels Friday Teaching Edition, everybody. And now, here's Bob Christopher. Well, Richard, we're on a very important topic yes. this uh, this week, yes. as we were last week, and it's our identity in Christ. And we're halfway through this particular chapter. We're going to pick up on page 88 today. Uh, but just for review, we talked about the fact that God created us in his image, and we were to reflect the very glory of God in this world. Well, sin made a mess of things. Yes. When Adam and Eve chose to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it just put us all in, in, a, in a bad way, so to speak. We lost our identity. We lost our purpose. We lost everything that God had designed for us. And so in Christ, we see all of those things being restored. Mm -hmm. And now we are recreated in the image of Christ. We're new creatures, and that's what we talked about last week. You know, for so long, I I looked at Christianity as a self-improvement program. Yes. You know, I was trying to get God to help me become a better person. Well, God doesn't make people better. He makes people new. Yes. And what's new about us is the fact that Jesus Christ lives in us, uh, the fact that we have a brand new identity, the fact that uh, we can walk in that new identity by faith in the risen Christ. Yes. That's what's new. We also, as this uh, study has been been designed to really focus on the fact that we're new covenant believers. We don't live in the old covenant. We live in the new covenant. Mm -hmm. So we've been given a new identity, which enables us to live as new covenant believers. That's who we are in Christ Jesus. Now, we're going to start on page 88, right in the center of the page, benefits of being a child of God. Um, so, you know, if you're a doctor, there's benefits to being a medical doctor. Yes. Uh, if you're a, a CEO, there's benefits to being a CEO. If you're a mom, there's benefits to being that very thing. Uh, the same is true as for us as, as, as children of God, but our benefits are so much better than anything that the world can offer to us. And that's what we're going to talk about today as we start this, this session. So benefits of being a child of God. And our first question uh, under this section is this, from what have you been delivered? And Paul gives a really concise answer, yes. doesn't he? Yes, right there in Ephesians 5, 8, the first half. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. That What an incredible statement. Yes, indeed. So we were once darkness, mm -hmm. so we were sinners by nature. Yes. We were darkness. We lived in darkness. Now we've been rescued, and we have become light in the Lord. So it's not, not just the fact that we were in darkness. We were darkness. Yes. And it's not the fact that now we're in the light, we are light in the Lord. Yes. Because Christ lives in us. Now, this gives us a very interesting study, darkness and light, light and darkness. And you have some uh, passages there for us to, to look at um, to give us some clues as to exactly what the writers of the New Testament are referring to when they say we are now light in the Lord. Yes. Um, this is a very, very tiny piece of the whole picture because light and dark are talked about a lot in the Bible and always consistently. Where I chose to start was when um, Mary and Joseph presented Jesus at the temple when he was a baby. And Simeon, who had been there waiting for this to happen, sees them and he says this, For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. So Simeon identifies the baby Jesus as the promised light. So there's a very strong clue as to what light is. Yes, indeed. It, it's not, it's not a, a, a little thing. It's, it's not here now and gone later. It's Jesus himself. 
and Jesus, in, when he was talking to Nicodemus in John 3, I won't read the whole passage, but if you'd like to, it's 16 through 21, he contrasts light and dark, saved and lost. And in the key passages, light has come into the world. That's him. Jesus Christ. But men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light, but whoever lives by the truth comes into the light. Okay, so so if you've accepted Jesus, you have now come into the light. He he comes into you, and now you are light, according to what Paul just we read in uh, Ephesians five, um, John eight twelve. When Jesus spoke again to the pe- people, he said, "I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life." So he's saying, "There's the contrast. You can be in darkness, living in the world." dead, or you can come to me and be light. Um, Peter says the same thing. 1 Peter 2, um, I won't read the the whole passage again, but you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. So there's this contrast, always and always it's there. You come from darkness, you come into light, out of darkness into light. That's a lifetime choice. It's an eternal it thing. It is an eternal thing, and I think that's what we need to really focus on here, that when it says that we are light in the Lord, it means we're saved. Yes. So light equals salvation. Yes. Light also equals being in fellowship with God. Yes. So if I'm, I'm in the light, I am in fellowship with God. Yes. So if I'm, I'm in the light, I'm saved, and if I'm saved, I'm in fellowship with God. Yes. So if I'm saved, and I'm in the light, I can't be out of fellowship with God. Correct. So you're either in the fellowship saved or you're either out of the fellowship lost. Mm -hmm. And if you're out of the fellowship, you're lost, you're in darkness. Those are the contrasts that we see in the Word of God. There's no 50 shades of gray as far no. as salvation is concerned. It's one or the other. It's one or the other. It's an on switch or an off switch. And so if you're lost, if you're a sinner, if you're dead spiritually, it's in the off position. You're in the darkness. Mm-hmm. Now, when Jesus comes, you recognize the light. You're drawn to the light. You receive the light uh, by grace through faith. That switch is turned on. Now you're in the light. You are light in the Lord. You're in the fellowship. You're saved. Yes. Those are the two options. You can't have anything in between. And God is never going to say, oh, I changed my mind. You're in the darkness. Absolutely. So sometimes people think, and certainly this is a teaching out there, that every time you sin, you are now out of fellowship with God. Yes. And so if you're out of fellowship with God, now you need to do something to get back into fellowship with God. So it's up to you to do that. Yes. God's mad at you because you've committed a sin. You told a lie. You stole something. You did this. You did that. Here are these sins that are there, and those sins have the consequence of turning God's back on you. Yes. So you have to do something to get him to turn back around so you can be in fellowship with him again. That's never taught in the Word of God. You can't find that theology in the Word of God. What you will find is you are either in the fellowship saved or out of the fellowship lost. Yes. It's that clear. If God could turn his back on you and put you out of fellowship, it would mean that he had said you are now lost. You would have to be saved again. Jesus would have to come again and die again and be raised again. That's just not going to happen. That's right. So we have to recognize that when God declares us to be children of God, that is an eternal status that we have. Yes. And nothing can undo that. Why? Because to undo it, you would have to undo the work of Jesus. Yes. And Jesus is not going to allow his work to be undone. Yeah. A lot of times with our our teaching, with our theology, we try to undo the work of Jesus so that we can add to it with our own works. But Jesus has none of that. So we have to accept the fact that if we're in the light, we are saved, we are in fellowship with yes. God. That's who we are Absolutely. as children of God. That's part of our identity. The second thing that we see in this particular section is out as a child of God, we have become heirs 
heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ. That's what Paul speaks to in Romans 8, 17. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. So we're part, we're, we're part of the will. Yes. We're part of this new we're covenant. The family. Those promises that God listed out in Jeremiah that were made effective at the death of Christ have been delivered over to us. Why? Because we're heirs, heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ Jesus. That is so cool to think of <laughs> in those terms. I know yeah. most of us think, gosh, if I, could, if, if I was just part of Bill Gates' family, just when he died, just all the blessings <laughs> that I would be given, all the riches that I would yes. be given. Well, we're we're part of a bigger, bitter, bigger family than that, yes. a family that lasts forever, an eternal family. We're a part of the family of God. We're co-heirs with Jesus Christ. So everything that belongs to Jesus Christ, everything that God the Father has poured into Jesus Christ is ours as well. Yes. That's amazing. And it's not something we have to wait for until Jesus dies. He died. That's right. And he's raised again. But because he died, all of that stuff belongs to us just like it belongs That's to him. That's exactly right. So a benefit of being, in a, being a child of God, you are now in the light. You are light in the Lord. You're an heir, a co-heir with Jesus Christ. You also have a new citizenship. Yes. Paul wrote this, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. So, you know, we're going through a season of political, Mm -hmm. uh, times and certainly there's a lot of confusion out out there as to the direction of our country you know we're we're vetting the candidates we're yes. listening to them we're trying to figure out which way they're going to lead us and and we're we're trying to figure out who to cast a vote for and that's a right and a privilege as U.S. citizens, mm -hmm. and we should take that right and privilege very seriously. Yes. We shouldn't abdicate it. We shouldn't just shrink back from it. We shouldn't just say, oh, I don't like any of them, so I'm not going to vote. I don't think that's uh, taking our role at a, as a citizen of the United States of America very seriously. But we have another citizen that citizenship that trumps our U.S. citizenship, yes. and that's the fact that we belong to Christ. We belong to the kingdom of God. When the, when the new heavens and the new earths are made, when this new Jerusalem comes down, we're going to take up our residence there. That's the city. That's the country. That's the world that we long for, this new Jerusalem. That's where we're going to live eternally. And now we have the privilege of representing that yes. here in the United States. Or if you're in Canada, in Canada, or if you're in Europe, in Europe, or if you're in the Middle East or Africa or South America yeah, or Australia, wherever you are, you're an ambassador for this kingdom. You are a part of this kingdom. You're a citizen of this, this kingdom. Your citizenship is in heaven. And you have an opportunity to res represent the things of heaven here on earth. So you yourself are one of those points where heaven and earth collide. Yes. Because you're a citizen of heaven. Mm -hmm. Because the God of heaven has come to live in you here and now. Now, also... Uh, you've been baptized into Christ, so you have a complete identification with Christ. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with yes. Christ. So you were in the world, in Adam. Mm -hmm. You were taken out of the world, out of Adam. You were placed into Jesus. Yes. So when he appears, you were going to appear with him. Uh, he has become your very life. Why? Because you have been placed in into into Christ Jesus and your life is safe in him for yes. you died and your life is now hidden with Christ and God and when Christ who is your life appears then you also will appear with him in glory that's good news yes you are safe within Christ himself yes and and it doesn't get any better than that we talk a lot about uh, the security of the believer assurance of salvation i think this passage answers that very clearly yes. you are safe in christ jesus Yeah, there's no unlesses or buts or if only's no. here it's 
It's you, just a statement. Your life is now hidden with Christ and God. Period. You're in his hands. He's yes. in his father's hands. No one can snatch us out of his hands. No one can snatch Jesus out of his father's hands. We are safe and secure. Assurance is ours. That's part of the benefits of being yes. A child of God. And I think, folks, if you are following along with us and that you have a study guide, you really should take this section and memorize these passages and and let these become the foundation upon which you stand. Because uh, these are the very things that are going to protect you from the attacks that come your way. Yes out there in the world and, and we're going to talk they do come and they do come and we're going to talk about those in just a minute this is basic gospel my name is bob christopher along with richard pfeiffer we are working through the new covenant journey study guide we've been doing that this is week 17 lesson 17 yeah. uh we're probably going to have uh maybe six more lessons uh in this particular study um, if you are new, if you're just tuning in to our broadcast, you can find all the information about our Friday teaching edition at basicgospel.net slash teaching. Yes. You can order the study guide right there. You can go back to past archives and listen, or you can watch. We're actually webcasting this. Yes. So you could see us in, in studio as we're working through this. If you want to share these with other people or maybe use them, uh, for a study guide that you, or for a Bible study that you're hosting, uh, feel free to do that. All that information is there for your use, for your service, to help you in your journey with Christ. And that's made available by the many people who stand with us in support, who give financially each and every month or give here and there every year. Uh, without the support of people like that, we couldn't do what we're doing. And we certainly encourage you to consider being a part of the Basic Gospel team yeah, to help deliver do. this good news through this teaching edition, through the regular daily broadcast, through our internet outreach, through the resources that we produce and deliver uh, to people all around the world. Come help be a part of what God is doing through Basic Gospel, a gift of $30, $100, $500 will make the world of difference in a person's life, struggling, looking for answers, looking for hope, looking for an, for encouragement. So yes. come be a part of this team. All the information on how to give, how to support Basic Gospel is at basicgospel.net. Well, let's get back to our study. So as we were talking about, you know, we live in this world that is anti-Christ, is anti-God, and so it's going to be anti-us as children of God. Uh, what Jesus endured, we can expect to have some of that as as far as the ridicule, the mocking, uh, the rejection, those sort of things. What he suffered uh, while he was alive, walking in dependence upon his father, we're subject to those same types yes. of sufferings. And a lot of that is going to take the form of attacks on our identity as children of God. I mean, the world doesn't know who we are. It has no earthly idea who we are as children of God. It doesn't know the status that we hold uh, with that identity. It doesn't know. But one day it will know when we are revealed with Jesus Christ. The, the world is going to look and say, oh, wow, I had no <laughs> earthly no idea. idea that those who named the name of Christ were going to have such importance in the world to come. I didn't know that. I wish I had known that. They don't know it today. So they're going to make fun of us today. They're going to ridicule us today. They're going to mock us today. So we need to be able to stand on a solid foundation to withstand those worldly attacks and also the attacks of our enemy, Satan himself. So we're going to start this section with this question. What do you know about yourself after salvation? What is true about you once you've been saved? And Paul wrote about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. He says, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. So as we've talked about, this new identity that we have in Christ is not just a name badge that we wear. Uh, It's not just something external that we adorn on our our clothes. There has been an internal change. Yes. And that change was so significant that God gave us a new identity 
child of God. So that change came about through washing, through sanctification, and through justification. So we were washed. So in Jesus, we have been cleansed once and for all of all of our unrighteousness. We see that in 1 John 1, 9. He is faithful and just to have, have cleansed us of all unrighteousness and to have forgiven us. Yes. So in Christ, we have been cleansed once and for all. That's why we're children of light. That's why we are now in the light. We have been cleansed of the darkness, and now we stand in the light. We've been sanctified. What does that mean? It means that we've been made holy. We've got a holy God and a bunch of unholy people. How are we going to connect? How are we going to relate? Well, God isn't going to become unholy. Uh, He cannot become unholy. By his very nature, he is holy. He is set apart from the world that he made. That's what makes him holy. He's different. And for us to connect to him, we have to be made like him. Yes. Not in... Uh, divinity, we, we don't become deity, we are simply set apart as he is set apart. We become holy. That's what it means to be sanctified, to be set apart. That's what has happened to us. We have been set apart by the work of the gospel and by the sanctifying work of God the Spirit. And then we've also been justified. We've been made righteous in the sight of God. We were unrighteous, and now we've been given his righteousness. He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And notice in this verse, and I think this is critical, each and every one of these is past tense. We were washed. We were sanctified. We were justified. These aren't ongoing processes. This is These are once and done things. These took place at our new birth. Yes. When we were born again into the kingdom of God, at that point, we were washed. We were sanctified. We were justified. And the results just continue on and on and on. That's exactly right. So it's upon these foundational truths that we take our stand. Yes. So when we have attacks against us, Uh, and we're going to have an attack from our enemy that's going to be accusatory. He accuses us. We just keep going back to this truth. What you, Satan, you can say I'm dirty all you want, but I've been washed. Why? Because it says it right there. The blood of Jesus has cleansed me of all unrighteousness. You can say that I'm just just mingling and co-mingling with the world, and I'm just worldly. But I can say I've been set apart. Maybe that action I just did isn't a set-apart action, but that doesn't change who I am. Yes. I'm a set-apart being. How? By the, by the work and the power of the Spirit of God. You may say that I'm not righteous, and certainly that action, that behavior, that sin doesn't look righteous, and it's not. But that doesn't change who I am. And if I'll keep standing on these truths, I will be anchored and can fend off any of these attacks that come our way. Um, As it says in Romans 8.33, who will bring bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? Well, Satan does. He brings charges against us almost daily, and they're accusatory. He is the accuser of the brethren. He accuses me. He accuses you. He accuses each and every one of us. And if we will go back to 1 Corinthians six eleven, and take our stand right there, those accusations will just fall yes. off. That's the power of the truth that we stand in. Well, this is Basic Gospel. Thanks for being with us today as we're continuing on our new covenant journey. We'll be back uh, next Friday to complete this chapter. At least that's our intention. <laughs> we hope we can do that. But uh, thanks for thanks for joining along with us today. All the information about the teaching edition is at basicgospel.net slash teaching. Take a look at it. If you're just tuning in, catch up so that you can be a part of the study next week. Have a great weekend. We'll see you on Monday. Mm-hmm.